what we can do. We can go ahead and open the meeting and then let them get ready. What do you roll call? Well, let me open the meeting. <laughs> All right, I'll open the uh, work session for Common Council for the August 5th, 2019 meeting. Uh, can I get a roll call, please? Councilperson Tony Abbott. Here. Councilperson Aaron Cook. Here. Councilperson Mel Davis. Here. Councilperson Randy Abner. Here. Councilperson Paul Seymour Jr. Here. Uh, Assistant City Attorney Zach Anderson. Here. And Mayor Kelly Milan. Here. And myself. All right. So, podium's all yours. Thank you. Um, I'm Aaron Bowdy. I'm uh, Vice President of Ivy Tech over the business and supply chain program statewide, uh, which includes our CDL presence in the state. Um, so we wanted to come and talk about the CDL need and um, asking for possible funding for that program. Um, in this area, there's 358 current CDL jobs available it's actually above the national average which is amazing can, when you consider a lot of the heavy um, industry in some of the metropolitan areas but you guys are above the national average and that's without even a, a possible port presence in the future and possible even um, exceeding growth um, we train drivers and it's a three-week program and one of the things that's great about that three-week program is if you look at a nurse that you know that's considered a great job after two years two and a half years to get your LPN or your RN to be a nurse you're gonna make 50 60,000 you can do the same thing with CDL in three weeks and we have people in this area companies paying six figures for these jobs with the average being in the 60s and 70s so it's a very easy way to get someone that may be at the poverty level into that middle class to where they can really contribute to a local economy and obviously we'd, we'd like to focus in on the Lawrenceburg residents and um, even possibly incorporate some other high demand areas that that you guys feel is need to create possibly a grant fund or however you guys um, would like to fund it but one of the needs we have is a person doesn't have the train costs forty five hundred dollars because it's very intensive it's three to four weeks we run this one in three weeks but they're going all day long and because of legislation and bureaucracy we can only have four students per instructor that's national legisl legislation for safety reasons so unlike a normal class where you could have 30 students one instructor we're capped at four because you have to have a seat belt for every single person you're training. So that drives up the cost. So a person making $12 an hour, they look for funding to fund that because they don't have $4,500 to pay for CDL training. So that's really where the demand is because we have a lot of people inquiring about the CDL program here in Lawrenceburg. They just don't have any way to pay for it. So we're trying to find any creative or uncreative way to help fund these folks that really are in that lower economic spectrum to get them up in the middle class get them their CDLA because the needs off the charts um, I was just in Richmond the other day giving a presentation we need 2200 drivers in the state every year from here moving forward we only license about 1400 so we're running an 800 um, driver deficit in the state every year. That's not even to mention the backlog that's where it is. There's 42 loads for every driver right now. The industry's changing, and you'll see it change even more. Um, the things I've seen, the three major indicators I see, I was 20 years with FedEx. We didn't hire anybody that was younger than 25, that didn't have two years experience, and when I left there in 2010, they were saying they didn't want any incidents. They couldn't have had a ticket, a seatbelt violation, anything. And the thing was, we're FedEx. We should be able to get who we want. I was at a recruiting event probably six months ago. The FedEx recruiter was there. And I go, what are you doing here? You don't even hire people with no driving experience. And they're like, we do now. And we hire 21-year-olds. 
So they've lowered it by four years and not required experience in just the span of eight years. <laughs> J.B. Hunt used to contract the manufacturers. They determined that's not even as profitable as just going on open boards, they call them spot boards, and just pulling loads off because there are so many and people are so desperate to move freight. It's just easier to be a free agent. And they used to you know, contract with GM and other manufacturers. Now, now we'll just go grab stuff off the internet and run it for people because it's such high margin because people have to pay a fortune because they can't get these loads moved. There was an article in Bloomington, um, Indiana, where I forget the name of the company, but it used to be Tree of Life. If you're familiar with that, they make natural foods, but they're manufacturer in Bloomington. They um, went to the press because they didn't have enough CDL drivers to get the, the inbound material into their plant to run production. They had to send their people home with no pay because they didn't have any material to run the plant. So it's, it's accelerating relatively quickly. Um, Subaru um, just recently moved money from one of their advanced manufacturing grants to CDL because they need 200 drivers in Lafayette, Indiana to help get the inbound into the freight. They need another 150 to car haul it out. That's how many they're short. And in sitting in these meetings, you never have someone that's con a carrier that's contracted to a manufacturer. You never hear them explain that they're having problems. They don't want Subaru or a big manufacturer to know that they're struggling because then that makes them think, well, maybe we should look for someone else. In that meeting, I not only told them that they were struggling, when Subaru says, well, we need to look for another vendor, the vendor said, go ahead. We can't backfill our drivers. Who are you gonna to get to come in here and hire all new drivers? I mean, that's where it's getting, is to where people's core business that's contracting these manufacturers, they're laying on the line. If we don't get money or more CDL drivers in this community, we're not gonna be able to operate. So that's the crisis we're talking about. And we, any way we could solve that would be great. But the bottleneck truly is we have people that want to do it. We have a school that can do it. It's just funding that training. Did I miss anything? Very good question. <laughs> I do have a question. Yeah, um, Kelly. Obviously, there's the car, DOT requirements when they're going to be driving. Do you screen for those prior to taking the class, or how does that work? Yep, they take a DOT physical and drug screen. And I can tell you, they drug screen them by surprise even during the training. So it's also a great way to get people that may be working at Burger King not towing the line to have a reason to tow the line and get in the truck, make a great living, and that's motivation to stay off of anything that they may have been on in the past. Um, truck driving is a great job in general. Um, I was with FedEx. We um, use both employee drivers and owner operators. And I always tell the story of I was a terminal manager, college graduate, had my master's running a FedEx terminal. I'm working you know, 12, 14 hours a day most days. An owner operator that started with us when he was 20 some years old hired a driver to run with him. We added more routes. He contracted more people. He ended up contracting with Landstar and some other companies. He now lives up in a town called Ludington, Michigan, has a little resort there on um, Lake Hamlin. And one winter he called me, he goes, what are you doing? I go, we're in Christmas season. Christmas season, uh, Casey, what do you need? And he's like, well, I'm sitting here drinking coffee, looking out my window, enjoying my life while all my drivers do my work. I'm like, yeah, I picked the wrong way. I should have got my CDL. <laughs> and hire drivers, but it is an entrepreneurial. We, you see a lot of people, Venture Logistics was contracted a large, second largest carrier in the state. Their president started out driving a truck, got a CDL because he needed money for college and was running part-time so he could pay for his college. And he ended up president of the second largest carrier in the state. Questions, guys? <clears throat> Casey was in college and another Lawrenceburg offered and I think it was in the area of $1,800 a year. So well, you, you should be able to pinpoint that. Yeah, we, uh, we send uh, $400,000 a year to the foundation to, uh, to uh, supplement the Tremaine Scholarship Fund. Um, and that, that covers the, uh, the new 
kids that will be taking advantage of it and also the ones that are in college for those four years, okay? <coughs> right now, I think what they do, they, they get $1,850 a year okay. is what they get. Um, that's what it's uh, been at for, for a few years. Um, yeah, um, I, I was um, intrigued by this uh, because obviously – I don't think we don't have anything for our adults that need some help I, that I'm aware of that you, unless you guys know of anything um, we obviously have great programs for the kids um, I think they you know the Tremaine scholarship is tremendous phenomenal um, so I think you know maybe we can work with the school and figure out something well let me May I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, do you take 18-year-olds into your program? We can train 18-year-olds, and we do, but by a federal law, there's a, some bills going through to maybe change that, but right now an 18-year-old cannot drive freight across state older. lines. 21 or older? Right. It's 21 or older you can go across state lines. 18 to 21 you cannot. You cannot be trained if you're less than 18 years old. I guess my question would be, is our kids that go to college, if they don't go, then they don't get the 1800 of course. Right. I mean, I is there any way we could put together something? We've obviously got, what, $7,200 invested in a, a person's education, and that is in the Lawrenceburg area only? That's for the Lawrenceburg schools. My question is, is, is how could we either, if, if I'm going to put, and I'm thinking of myself as a, you know, parent sending a young person to school, mine fortunately graduated and everything's good, but I'm sitting here thinking, I don't want to pay you guys five grand and then somebody not make it through your class and not get a job. Is there any way that if we would commit an amount of money that we all agreed on for these people that we wouldn't have to do it until they came up with the passing and and the job? Is there is there and here's the other thing I think. It's good for the community if we go a little bit farther. Would you guys be willing to think about Aurora Greendale? Would you be willing to think about Denver County? Or, or are we just thinking about Lawrenceburg? That's my question for everybody in the room. Well, I, I think you need to figure out uh, what the need is, okay? And I'm sure Tina and her company and Ivy Tech knows, they know what that need is. They probably have it segregated out by, okay, here's how many people from Lawrenceburg are actually on the list waiting for, they just can't do it because they don't have funding, okay? Or there's how, this, this many people in Dearborn County that is on the list uh, waiting because they just don't have funding. Um, I, I would, uh, I would, I would uh, you know, I think we need to make sure that we would be the, um, if there's a, uh, some money out there that Lawrenceburg commits to a, a program, obviously it has to go through a, a foundation because it has to go through a nonprofit, okay? Because we'd, we would be grabbing the money from community foundation, sending it to the 501c3, that which Ivy Tech has, okay? Because we don't have a grant program set up for that. It would have to come through them to the, the foundation. I would say that then, you know, there's parameters that you would put on this program that, you know, I'm sure there'd be a committee of people set up to do that. And then uh, I'm just basing this upon how I know that um, other programs have been set up at the school, high school. But um, And then it, you could say, you know, we would be the, you know, our pot of money is the last pot of money considered after everything else has been, exa been exhausted. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, does. did up until just then. Well, if they have other other options to grab money, so they, whether it's from the state or from okay, now whatever, you know, so and say they, if they... They go out and get grants and other funding, that's used first before it comes to... Yeah. 
Okay. You know, say they, they can come up with 3,500. Yeah. And they need another 1,500. That wouldn't come. That would come out of our pot after they've exhausted. And we're talking about each individual person. Yes. Okay. Something like that. I, right, thank just you. a for instance. That doesn't have to be like that. Go ahead, Mel. Okay. Would Would Ivy Tech or could Ivy Tech? fund those folks like if Paul said you, you put a restriction on them they have to get a job bang Good from what idea. I hear there's no no short they, they have a hundred percent place right yeah usually there's about five offers per student at most of our schools right now because there's such a shortage but I think your other question was what they don't finish yeah would you fund that until they get a job and then we could pay you the 1500 or whatever it is Jim, do you want to come up and? I don't. I think I don't know what the statistics are on people dropping out and then continuing. Usually, and you probably have the percentages of so, the students go through. Yeah. So I'm I'm Jim Patterson. I'm with uh, Driving Dynamics, CTS Driving Academy, and we partnered with Ivy Tech to provide the service here. So, usually our um, our dropout rate is very low. If, if, but in any case, if, if you're if you can't be a brain surgeon, you shouldn't be a brain surgeon. Okay, some people can't drive a truck as well, but and some people we don't want driving trucks as well. But in most cases, you know, we'll have six people come into a class. We'll have four to five that'll pass right away. Our pass rate with the CDL skills exam is about 89% first time pass rate. Second time pass rate, they typically all, pa all pass through. So, and once they get passed through the system, there is no problem getting a job. Trust me, is what I tell every one of them. If you keep a clean driving record and you can stay away from things that you shouldn't have, you will have a job for life, literally. And right now, these people are making excellent money. You know, when I started out, I was a former CDL driver myself many years ago. Um, I was making 26 cents a mile. If I was lucky, I brought home $42,000 a year. They're laughing at me because I left because now they're making 65, 70. If you look at Walmart, they're making $100,000 a year. Okay. I will tell you, if you were to go down to Texas and work at Halliburton down there, you'd be making $150,000 a year, okay. just because you held a CDL in your pocket. So that's all money that comes back to you in the community. That's all I'm going to say about that part of it. But I would tell you that we are going to have some failures, but it, to the amount that you know, you may have one or two that fail within what? How many? Tina, have we lost in the past year? Maybe two. Two. So. That's typical. So about a 90% pass rate. About a 90% pass rate. Or better. Or better. And that's the advantage of having four people to one instructor. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. The cost is the disadvantage. And one thing we talked about, uh, we did a open house in uh, Richmond last week, and one of the things I think is a misconception is if, if you run in, let's say, you realize you have a crisis. This isn't a industry where you can say, well, let's just ramp this up and train 48 people next month. And, you know, let's start ramping up. That's not how it works because of how costly it is. It's legislated for every four students. Not only is there an instructor, you have to have a truck. You have to have a certain size lot for those four students. So to bump that up, you know, you're trying to find every piece of cement in town and have the BMB come up and prove it. It's impossible. The, the way to solve it is to constantly feed, you know, eight, 12 people a month through it so you get, you know, the amount you need in a community over time. And one of the issues we've had, and uh, we were talking a little earlier, was, you know, you have to, even to be able to run it, you got to have three students. Uh, we shoot for four, but what happens a lot of times is you have one, two people that found the funding and they want to do it and they're ready, but we didn't we didn't have two other people then the other people that wanted to do it like tina's got 17 people sitting on her desk right now with lawrenceburg city addresses they're just waiting to find some way to pay for it so if we could take two of those and say okay we have funding this funding source and and match them up and put those two with the other two we can run the class which really not only gets us the two you funded they get you the two that wanted to pay for it themselves, but we couldn't run class because we didn't we couldn't get a class large enough. Yeah, 
approaching any other communities for funding assistance to, uh, for this program? Oh, yeah. We, Lafayette, one of the things Lafayette did, because of the Subaru, they tied it to manufacturing. Um, they pulled, they had several million from the Skill Up and America's Promise Grants. They split a bunch of that money off to pay for CDL to go through the training. And then they have another grant called the Wabash Heartland Innovation Network, but the WIND grant. Um, they're buying a simulator to help the training so that they, because you can actually train more people with the simulator because you don't have the same regulations. They can get the muscle memory and the safety and all that stuff done on the simulator. So they're looking at funding that, and that's $310,000 that they're looking to fund for the simulator. Now, they're not paying for all of it. Purdue is actually part of that grant, and Ivy Tech. Let me ask another question, just a personal question. Yep. When you train them, do you tell them not to tailgate old <laughs> people like me? You have to know where I came from. So <laughs> that's one of my pet peeves is seeing a truck behind me in my mirror here. So that is one. They go through a very extensive defensive driving course. It's one we actually did, uh, designed with the Colorado State Patrol. Um, in fact, he works with us, uh, Bruce uh, uh, Davison. He's a former lieutenant colonel with the Colorado State Patrol. So we all designed this program together. It also follows the National Safety Council, so okay. if you're familiar with that, so yes, yes, I do. <laughs> I also teach them not to go down mountains very quickly either, because I'm from Colorado, <laughs> so you know we teach them that as well. Is there a certain dollar amount that you're looking for the city to invest in this? Well, um, you want to answer that? I'm not. <laughs> I mean, we would take whatever you had, and it's uh, tough because we don't want a figure that's so large that you guys are like, whatever. But funding two a month at, as a minimum, I think, is a way to keep it going. So if you fund two a month, that's going on ten grand a month, so you're talking 120000 for a year. You take that out five years for a fund, you know, half a million dollars. That would be, that would be what I would consider a – the minimum I would want to come in with, not that we wouldn't take less, but that, that I would ask for, because that solves the problem each month, you have know, being able to fill classes and keep a continuous classes. The big issue we have is people get discouraged because they have to wait that time and can't get in the class because we didn't run it because we only had one or two funded students. Trying to get four, four to eight a month and just keep cranking them out every month in those four to eight increments at 12 if we could, but... Um, to get really the system whole. And I mean, if we've had focus groups. We had one down here. Um, I think we had 18 trucking companies show right. up. Um, and they're all struggling. And the trucking companies are really bearing the burden. But um, a lot of people don't know, coming from FedEx, it's a 6% margin. I think sometimes people look at FedEx and UPS and think that they have this huge margin they make. It's a 6% margin for carriers like FedEx and UPS, and they're massive. There's just not a lot of money to be made because by the time you get pounded down by the Walmarts and the Targets and you got to take all their freight at a negative margin to put on the lights, you really struggle to keep that margin. Now they make billions of dollars, so 6% actually ends up a lot of money. But they don't have a lot of money just to start feeding the CDL industry. But companies do pay for it, but what they do is they take it out of their check. So the people end up paying for it in the end, regardless, because they, they just get a reduced rate. It's a, it's a great industry. It's just, and we've done a lot of things to improve it. Someone from Lawrenceburg that wants to drive a truck and they're 21, we fund them through this training two years from now. They're like, I don't like driving. They can apply that CDLA license and crosswalk it into eight, credits for Ivy Tech and go get their supply chain management degree and become a warehouse manager or manufacturing manager if they want to transition from driver. So we've taken those credits from the non-credit training and said if this person went through this very intensive training, understands truck driving, went through all the safety, has carried loads, has operated in warehouses, we're going to give them eight credit hours towards our degree program. So they can actually get the, those credits as well. You said there's about 17 people from the city of Lawrenceburg. Um, Right now? Yep, that was the number, right, right Tim? <coughs> she knew she had 17. She thought she might have more. How about this year, every month? How have you done this year, every month? For classes? For, you're saying you'd like to run four a month, four class, four people a month to a class? Mm -hmm. What What do you think you're, what do you think you've done up until July here? I guess for now, um, in the schools that I I run, I've tr I've brought in 115 people 
for all of them, but for not just Lawrenceburg. Uh, I'm talking about Lawrenceburg. Uh, Lawrenceburg, I'm probably what, 40, 38, 40? 38, 40. 40. 40. Pretty close. Or more. That's how many is completed? Well, that's January to current. That's not your fiscal year, but yes. I ran three IEP classes, but they got their funding cut too. And it really needs to be closer to eight. Because we run, we can get some that um, to run up four, but then we can't run that second class. Because I think you're targeting eight in Lawrenceburg. If some of our, like Connorsville, we'd die for four, but in Lawrenceburg, we have more people applying. That would be the thing. If people weren't wanting to do it, we'd just say the market's dead. But people do want to do it. We just don't have a way to get them funded for it. So, I mean, if we could run actually eight a month in Lawrenceburg, but we, your funding still, if we could just fill up that cohort and fund filling up that class of four. <coughs> so if we have filled the class of four, if there's two already got funding, we're just asking, can we fund the other two through, through another source to get a complete class to finish those four out? I try to run 16 classes a year, not one a month. I usually run one every three weeks. Right. What do you think your largest age group is that you're that you're training 21 to 27 year olds 27 you're, to 40 year olds or? the 21 year olds are hard because they they, they don't want to leave that computer that's uh, that's very difficult i'd say uh, right here in this area probably 28 to 30 <coughs> in that age group but keep in mind right now the mm -hmm. average uh, or the median age for a truck driver is 49 to 50 so they're all retiring pretty soon you know like me i want to leave and go home we're all retiring pretty soon, so that's where that stands. And I work a lot with manufacturing too. It's a little different than manufacturing because in manufacturing, they can talk the guy into staying another year, two, three years, pay him more, make some concessions to him, maybe say, hey, can you just come in four days a week <laughs> instead of five? Right. And that happens a lot now in manufacturing. <clears throat> the difference is with trucking, they physical out. So if they're you know, 67 and they want to keep driving, if their blood pressure is so high, they, they can't drive anymore because they can't pass the physical or if their eyes are getting too bad or sleep apnea certain medications so you, you know just like with me it seems like the older I get the more medications I get <laughs> and, and the more loud I sleep as as a husband so my wife I think she's trying to put me on sleep apnea <laughs> but that's the difference the trucking companies can't say hey Jim can you just hang on for another couple of years don't retire we'll give you some more cash We'll cut down your workload a little bit. We just need you to keep running. If he can't pass his physical and he's in his 60s, he can't get That's the other thing. If you look at something like nursing or industrial maintenance, there's a lot of things companies do to kind of work around the edges. Well, we'll have a medical assistant do this that a nurse normally did, so we need less nurses because we don't have enough nurses. Truck driving, there's one person driving that truck. If they don't, if they can't drive it or you don't have a licensed person in that truck, there's not really much else you can do. The load just sits. So it's, it's kind of a unique industry where there's not a lot of workarounds. You know, it, they're either licensed or they're not. Go ahead. Just the, the only question, the reason I came here tonight because my degree is in training and development. Okay. And, and I think that this is an excellent program that there's certainly a need for training truck drivers. Uh, look at the local paper. Nine out of 10 jobs listed in the paper is truck driving jobs. Look on the internet, nine out of 10 jobs, truck driving jobs. But my only question about this program is, is how do you qualify somebody for a grant? Uh, say Randy and I want to become truck drivers. Randy comes from a wealthy family. I come from, I'm broke. But how do you qualify who gets the money? Can Randy apply as well as me? Well, no. that's, that, that's going back to the parameters that need to be set up, and it would be set up by the school uh, to determine, okay, hey, uh, they have the income that they, you know, they can pay for this on their own. And this person is making that $10 an hour job and he or she can't do that on their own, they would be the ones that would qualify and only after they had maybe exhausted all the other avenues for funding. So I think it would be, yeah, good point, but I, I think that's the way it would happen. Am I correct in that? Correct. Okay. Uh, but I want to emphasize, I think that it's 
this uh, wonderful program. Uh, said, Lord, if you could pump out 20, 30 truck drivers in this local area down here where people are making 50 to $60,000 a year, they're going to live here. They're going to buy a home. They're going to buy automobiles. They just can't park their truck on the street. That's, That's right. right. <laughs> <laughs> I think We're going to have them park right in front of Tina's house. <laughs> That's when you invest yeah, in the I think, personally, I think we ought to give it a shot. Oh, let's see okay, um, I, I would, I would suggest you let let me uh, talk with Fred McCarter and the school, and try to set up some balance. kind of a, <clears throat> and yeah. and bring it back to you guys and say, hey, this is what, what this would look like. Yeah. If, if that makes sense. And then you guys can say, nah, you know, we need to maybe up that or no, we need to cut that back or go that route. It, it isn't going to take away from the other, right? No. Just, no. Okay. No, no, gonna bring no. I'm going to look for, that's why I want to talk to Fred and say, hey, you know, there might be, you know, we're not adding to the budget. It's just right. rearranging down there. And well, I, I think it's a great opportunity. I know I went through an apprenticeship program. And uh, the, I think it's a great opportunity for people, myself. Can I make one final point just to, sure. to, for, just for thought? So February 2020, the Federal Motor Carrier reg, uh, regulations have changed toward entry-level driver training. <coughs> and you may have read this. You've probably seen it in the news. So what's going to take place in February is all of the educators, myself included, and my staff will be certified by the federal government to provide this type of training. If you are not certified by the federal government, you will not be permitted to provide this type of training. That's going to wipe out the individuals who have gone with their brother or their sister or whoever it may be down to the DMV to go get a CDL license because they're not going to be able to do that anymore. Okay? A lot of the smaller um, trucking companies that have been providing their own training, they've got a driver, you know, trainer somewhere in their fleet, they're going to have to stop unless they're willing to go and get certified by the federal government. So the demand is going to increase, not decrease. So I just wanted to bring that point up real quickly. Okay. Okay. Aaron, do you have something? Yeah, I was going to ask when you talk to Fred, we um, get the residency requirements in there, like if it's county or city or? Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that whatever we bring back, I mean, and you guys can tweak the, you know, we'll, we'll figure out, you know, some parameters and, and, the, and the money situation, things like that, bring it back to you guys. How do you, do you, how big of a region in this school do you think you serve right now? Generally, that kind of the Larchburg, Batesville, Kansas is usually our service areas defined as Franklin, Dearborn, Ohio, and Ripley. Generally, out of these two campuses, and specifically here in Larchburg, that's our footprint, if you want to call it our service area. That's not including Ohio, Kentucky, it's just the Indiana County. High school students all the way from or, sorry, Madison and Brookville. If we go a little bit further, most, um, there's nothing down there is why they come here for us. But we wouldn't necessarily have to fund those students with this. Okay. Are you guys okay with the path forward? Yep. And then we'll come back and, yep. How soon can we put a timeline on this thing well I, I I'll, I'll get with Fred and uh, the school and whoever I mean I don't maybe at this week or next but we'll get it put together maybe for the next next meeting or some kind of an outline of it if we could have another that outline works of for me the next meeting yeah. where we look at it towards me okay you guys okay with that yep yeah. fine all right, we'll do that. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Yes, Bet. thank you very much. All right. All right, well, this was all we had for this session. But, uh, well, now you can have a little bit of break, guys, before it goes over. What's that? So now you can have a little break before 6 o'clock. I know. Tony wants a break. So. <laughs> anyway, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, Second. Moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mayor. Pleasure Thanks, meeting you guys. guys.